And so indeed, um, today is the final sermon in the mini-series that we have been running at the 2.30 um, called Champions for Christ. And we need to know, don't we, and declare today, we are in it to win it. Christ did not call us to lose. We are already on the winning side. Why then do we struggle? If we are already on the winning side, if we belong to the one who has already won the victory, why then do we struggle? Let's have a look today what it takes to be a real champion for Jesus Christ. And my key verse is taken from Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 to 14. Straining toward the goal. Hallelujah. Not that I, verse 12, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is Paul talking about today? What does he want to make his own? Way back in verse eight, which was picked up last week when Andrew was preaching, in verse eight of Philippians three, the second part of it says, for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. Paul knew that everything he had ever done in his life, everything he'd ever attained, everything he'd ever achieved, everything he'd ever gained, every great thing, every awful thing, he knew that it was nothing. And he declared that, lost all things. He suffered loss of all things but he counted those things that he had lost as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. What is it that Paul had not already obtained but was striving towards that he would gain Jesus Christ? There was his goal and that remained his goal. I want Jesus. I want to be um, owned I want him to be my own. I am his own already. But I'm striving, I'm pressing toward, I'm stretching, I'm pushing. I want to make Christ my own. I want to gain Jesus Christ. So first of all, let's look at this amazing word, champion. What image appears in your mind when you hear the word champion? What springs to your mind? Is it perhaps a sports person as the person behind me going out to bat? The dictionary definition says, a person who has surpassed all rivals in a sporting contest or other competition. So there's something about fight in this. There's something about um, fighting to win in that definition a person who has surpassed all rivals. So they're striving, they're competing to do something. And here you can see this batsman looks like he is determined to win. So is that the first picture you get, a sportsman? I quite like um, Ronnie O'Sullivan in snooker. And as many of you may not think that that's a competitive um, and aggressive sport, but... Uh, He's marvellous. I think he's amazing, skilled, talented, but he is not going through to the World Championship. And so I end my watching of the Championship because I only want him to win. But if it's not a sportsman, do you see the strong man bodybuilder? Is that your image of a champion? The one who's got all the muscles, all of the strength. The dictionary definition again of the word champion says, a person who vigorously supports or defends 
a personal cause. If you're being defended, you think of somebody who is strong and agile and able to protect. Is that your image of a champion? Or perhaps some of you have the image of a cartoon character, a superhero. I, I, I was thinking about one from my days of old. I'm not as young as I look. I was thinking about Popeye, the sailor man. But let me give you a demonstration. Here comes an ordinary man with no power. You wouldn't look at him and think, wow, here's my superhero. He's the one who's come to save me. No, 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 no. no. But suddenly, a situation occurs and he changes. He puts on the clothes. Is it Superman? Is it Spider-Man? Is it Popeye eating the spinach? And suddenly before us is a champion saving the world, saving anyone out of distress because of a jacket. Thank you, Andrew, so much for the demonstration. But is that your image? A sports person, winning, competitive, got to be the best. The strong man, the one that you see as the one who could sort out a fight in the street and protect. Is it the superhero who's given powers? I was thinking about Popeye because I was watching a little video about him and how clumsy he was in general in life, just like that ordinary man that came up. And yet, when he had the spinach, when he was filled with the spinach, he, he became powerful. He became a hero. Let's turn to some champions that we can see in the Bible. Let's find out and explore what they were filled with, because it certainly wasn't spinach, was it? We could speak of some who could be called champions in the Old Testament. Moses. Moses was used of God to deliver Israel from Egypt, from bondage in Egypt. He knew only God could do this though. Moses knew right from the beginning when God called him, he didn't have the ability. He needed to rely on God and God's power. And so during his own journey, he continually sought the Lord every step of the way, going into the presence of the Lord, to have answers. He relied on the Lord, not himself. Or we could look at Joshua, who followed Moses, and whom God used to conquer and take the promised land. There, another champion, doing what the Lord had called him to do. Or what about Gideon? Through God's enabling, Gideon rallied just 300 men and took out an army of 22,000 with 300 men. What a champion. Let's go over to the New Testament. In one day, and wouldn't we evangelists like this to be said of us? Simon Peter, preaching the good news under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 3,000 come to Jesus Christ in one day. What a catch. That's a bit of a champion. What about Philip in the New Testament, the evangelist who revived the city of Samaria until even its sorcerer was converted? No person left untouched, no stone left untouched. Some of our more modern day people, evangelists, world evangelists, men and women of God, We've heard about some of the things they've done. And I remember a particular world evangelist who at some point was in um, the nation of Haiti. And he had gone to, they were annoyed with him because he closed down a school that was for the deaf and dumb because they all got healed. Bit of a champion there again for the gospel. And more modern times again, we have those who have made their mark for the truth in history. 
What about Martin Luther of the 1500s who championed the start of the Reformation, not without great cost and great pain to himself, but because of truth, he pressed forward. Or an Amanda Berry Smith who was featured in October and uh, the story is still there on the website, on our KT website. Amanda Berry Smith who defied being a woman, being black, in her time, not being acceptable. She risked being unacceptable as she forged forward around the world with the gospel message because the gospel message was more exciting and more important to her than her own life. Just like Paul said, I count all but loss. I, I suffered loss. Amanda Berry Smith would have said the same thing. I don't care. If they don't like me, if they don't want me, it's Jesus I bring, champions for Jesus Christ. But what do we notice about these people above? Well, first of all, they were all about doing the Lord's business, not their own. Their goals were his goals. Paul again says, I press toward the mark of the high calling. I've got a goal. I've got somewhere that I'm looking to. And all of the above that we just spoken about, or you've just heard about, they were doing the Lord's business, not their own. I want to highlight a couple of people back in the Old Testament in particular, as I always enjoy their stories, but keep this in mind. None of them lived for themselves once they were called. First of all, we're going to look in 1 Samuel 17. You don't need to go there, but that's where the story is coming from. And it's the story of David, who would become the king of Israel. And I think we're going to see an image of David and Goliath in a few seconds. But let me talk about him. No one in all of Israel could defeat the Philistines' giant Goliath. A whole army trained up in Israel could not defeat Goliath. And the Philistines were walking in their victory because they knew they had at the helm Goliath and no one could touch him. But David was an untrained man when it came to military standards. David's training ground was as a shepherd. David was one who knew how to conquer a lion and a bear. He had to protect the sheep. So he knew how to fight without the military training. Look at him, little man against big man. Obviously by sight, anyone would assume the big man is going to win. Anyone would assume he's the strongest one, he's got all the armour, all the protection on, and he will win. This little man shouldn't be challenging him. From the natural eyes, that's how it looks, that David could never win, and that he was laughed at by his brothers and laughed at by the army, but desperate was Saul, the king at the time, that would give him the opportunity. Yet this little man did conquer Goliath. Why? Why did he conquer Goliath? Was it because he was strong, powerful, gifted, talented, intelligent, special? No. Let's move on, thank you for that slide, to Samson. And we read the story of Samson in the books of Judges 13, right through to 16. First of all, it tells us that even before Samson was in his mother's womb and when he was in her womb and he was a special child, long awaited for, the Lord had declared him a Nazarite, declared him a separated unto God. So there, first of all, was his call. He was separated with a purpose. His purpose was that he would begin to save Israel 
from the Philistines. Here we go again, these lovely Philistines that we're trying to always battle with. But the Philistines have already lost in our lives right now, I declare. So Samson is born with a purpose from God and he's born with an edict given to his mother. Don't touch this, don't drink that, don't do this because he's a Nazarite. He's separated unto me. And could we see him as a true champion? His journey wasn't easy. His journey was up and his journey was down. His journey was one of victories, ripping the mouths of a lion with his bare hands, conquering little fractions of the Philistine army until he lost his own sight and possibly, as some would have thought, his own power. Yet it ends with his life being given up but conquering the Philistines right at the end. So two champions in the Old Testament. And although their journeys, their purpose was different, one was destined to be the king of Israel, the other destined to bring Israel into victory out of the the enemy's hands, they still had something in common when it came to battle. Now, remember I was saying that Popeye had to fill his stomach with spinach to have strength to fight his battles. And our superheroes would change into costumes and clothing and and all sorts of things to suddenly have power. But these champions were filled with the only power that can save and that can rescue. They were filled with the spirit of the living God. They knew that they did not have power within themselves to do anything at all. They could not call themselves champions because of what they had, because of their gifts, because of their talents, because even of their fearlessness. No, they knew that it was the Holy Spirit of the living God and His power. A number of times in Judges, when it came to Samson, It quotes, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Nothing happened when it came to victory unless the Spirit of the Lord had come upon Samson. While David cries in the Psalms, do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew that it was only the Holy Spirit of the Lord that gave him ability, that gave him power, that gave him strength, that gave him boldness. I know in the book of Acts, one of my favourite scriptures talks about, um, you know, uh, giving us boldness with boldness in the book of Acts. And I think boldness could only come as a cry to the Lord. As David said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. I can't do Without you, I can't do without your presence. I can't do anything unless you fill me with your spirit. So spinach couldn't do it and clothing couldn't do it and costumes couldn't do it. These men knew that it was the spirit of the living God at work and in control of their lives. Let's look again, Paul says in this same text, Philippians 3, 12 to 14. We've ascertained not that I have already obtained this Christ that I am looking to gain. I haven't reached perfection yet. I press on to make it my own. His reason is because Christ Jesus has made me his own. We start there. We acknowledge we belong to Jesus Christ. We belong to the one who has conquered death, hell and the grave. We belong to the one who has already given us the victory. Paul knew because Christ Jesus has made me his own, I belong to him, I cannot fail. I am willing to suffer. I am willing to die. I am willing 
because I know that I'm going to gain the best prize in the world. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I press on, I look, what lies ahead of me? The goal, Jesus Christ is the one I must obtain. Think of that batsman. Look at the focus he had there in that photograph. And he's focused only on making sure he hits that ball. He's not gonna miss it because he doesn't take his eyes off. Paul pressed toward the goal of obtaining and gaining Christ by fixing his eyes, by keeping his eyes on Jesus Christ and not moving from that. No matter what was thrown at him, I press toward, I press toward. I'm running a race. Look what it says, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses three to five. Paul would not boast, he would not boast. Let me read from verse three, 1 Corinthians 2. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men. No matter how wise and intelligent we appear to be, in the sight of the Lord, we are not The wisdom of men compared to the wisdom of God is but a small thing. He says so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, so that you might not rely on men. You might not rely on their opinions of you. You might not rely on what they say about you. Oh, you're the best. You'll make it. No, he wants them to rely, but in the power of God alone, of God alone. Paul is pressing toward that goal. He's not boasting in himself. He calls himself weak. He he says he's in fear. He says he's in trembling because he's not gonna boast. Paul was truly only for Christ to Jesus and he would not boast in anything that he was or in anything that he did. He wouldn't boast. It's not me, it's Christ's power. It's Christ's spirit in me, it's not me. We established that his goal is to gain Christ and we see that Paul wants to get to the finishing line. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call, to gain the prize of eternal life. Paul has a goal and he doesn't move from it. Let me read you also verse three of Philippians chapter three, but I'm going to read it from the Amplified because there's a a fantastic teaching here for us, and something for us to truly grasp. Philippians 3, verse 3, Amplified Bible. For we Christians are the true circumcision, who worship God in spirit and by the Spirit of God and exalt and glory and pride ourselves in Jesus Christ. Here we go. And put no confidence or dependence on what we are, In the flesh, we put no confidence, we're not dependent on what we are in the flesh and on outward privileges and physical advantages and external appearances. We will not put our confidence in who we are. We will not put our confidence in the flesh. How many times we think something and we're so wrong. How many times does our flesh and our emotions get all involved and all upset about something and we're totally wrong? because we can't rely on the flesh, it's unreliable. That's why Paul said, I put it under, I put my body under, under the power of God. We cannot rely on our flesh, we cannot rely on outward privileges, the Amplified says. If I do this, I please that person, and I gain, I gain. Then the day you don't please the person, you're gonna rely on that, on outward privileges on things that are here today and gone tomorrow. I don't rely on physical advantages like the strong man, just because I'm full of muscles and I think I have it all. But what do I have inside of me? We don't rely on external appearances. This too was the stories of the Old and the New Testament champions. 
It means David knew who his God is and what he therefore carried and could achieve. Just by reading the Psalms, you know the amount of things that David declared about the Lord God. You know how he leaned on him, how he he was desperate for him. He knew who his God is and what was inside of him. Again, Samson, he asked the Lord right at that last minute. He thought that the power perhaps had gone and everybody else, because his hair had been cut off where his so-called strength lay, thought that it had been cut off, thought that it was gone, but yet he's standing between the two pillars in the temple, full of 3,000 odd Philistines, every leader, every king, every high person in that um, territory was in that temple, that auditorium. And Samson stands between the two pillars and he cries to the Lord. Remember me one more time. He wasn't saying, remember who I was, remember what I achieved. He was saying, remember your power at work through me one more time. What you called me to do, that goal that lay at the beginning of my life, I need your strength again. I need the strength of the Holy Spirit one more time and I will achieve, I will conquer, I will. And there came the Spirit of God, the strength of God, the power of God to do what He was originally called to do. He pushed, those pillows came down and the Philistines were conquered by the victorious one, Jesus Christ conquered. Paul said, I pressed toward the goal. Did the others achieve their God-given goals? Moses, I say, did. He led the Israelites out of Egypt under the power of God and at least to the edge of the promised land. Joshua did lead the Israelites into the promised land, not without fight, not without battle and certainly not without the Spirit of God. And so many others in the Bible, when God called them to do something, they did it. Even if they stressed with him a bit, like Jonah, even if they refused a little bit, they still had their God-given goal, their God-given purpose, and they were equipped by the Spirit of God to do it. It seemed each of them did achieve their goals. I ask us a question today. Will you, will I achieve the goal set before us by the Lord Jesus Christ? Not what I think I should be or want to be. When I was a little girl, the first thing I wanted to be was a singer and a performer and an actress. My dad wanted me to be a brain surgeon or an engineer. I did all sorts of things in my teens to try to conjure up a talent called singing, which I didn't really have. I had to be taught to sing. I had to take lessons and I can sing a little bit. But that was my dream. Let me be a singer. Let me be a performer on the stage. Let me be an actress. That wasn't the plan of the Lord for my life. Will will I is the question and will you is the question. Chase your dreams continually. (laughs) Will you bail out? if you decide to take the goal of the Lord for your life and then it looks impossible. I have to interject here, I do, Paulette, that question was for you. Will you lay your dreams down and take up the call of God, the goal that the Lord has set before you? That is set before you. Many of us, not just Paulette, thank you for giving me that privilege. And she must test if that question is for her or not. Just because I've said so, it doesn't mean. We all must test everything we hear from the platform and everything we hear from the mouth of somebody who might think or say that they're a prophet or anything else. We're mature Christians, aren't we? Test everything. But there's a sense, and a, that, that, that question is large. Will you take up the goal of God and achieve what he has called you to be and to do 
or bail out when it looks hard. Bail out, run away when it looks like I can't do this. But that's the quest, question, isn't it? And that's the quiz, that's the issue. It's the I can't do this, we can't. When are we going to get a hold of the fact that we can't? But we can because we have the Spirit of God in us. As I conclude today, I want to look at one more aspect. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, it says, run in such a way that you may win. That you may win. Run in such a way as if there's no other option. You're racing toward the finishing line. Run like that, as if you are going to win. In the Old Testament, often the champion was just one person. It was a Moses or a David. It was a Deborah. It was a Samson. A Jonah. It was one of the major prophets like Isaiah or Jeremiah. It was one person that God would call at a given time and work through and place his spirit upon. They would rescue a nation and there would be evidence that the hand of the Lord was upon them. But since Christ's death, the Holy Spirit, we are taught, has been poured out to all who come to him, men and women, young and old. So we're not a one-man band anymore. There's not one champion among us. And that's why the series is called Champions for Christ. No, we are a team of champions working together. And we're part of a team that cannot lose. Christ's death purchased our place on the team. We're signed up because of his death and we said yes. And he is the head of the team. And Christ already is our victory. Do we really identify with being on his winning team, belonging to a team of champions? What does it look like when you're in a team of people? And let's have that last slide up, please. What does it look like when you're in it together? You look victorious, but you're not alone. There's more than one of you and you're all celebrating together and you're moving together and you're working together as champions. Did the men and women of old do it? Yes, they did. Will you do it? Yes, you will. In this team, we must know that as followers of Christ, we are already champions. One of the things that Paul boasts about so much and cries out for, I may know him and the power of his resurrection. So what does a biblical and what does a, a modern day Christian champion really look like? We're together as we are in that boat. But these champions, we're together with those who know they are to establish God's purpose, to do his will. We're with champions who know that all the glory is the Lord's. It's all about him. We're together with champions who don't make excuses. Who don't give up when it looks hard. Who sees and knows their goal. Paul pressed towards, Paul fixed his eyes. We're together with champions who act, who do, who forge ahead. Press toward. We're with champions who don't rely on their own skills, gifts or talents at all, but rely on the power of the Spirit of God. We're with champions who hold their ground in times of conflict. Do we? Together. Do you see yourself as one of these? Do you see yourself in that boat as part of a team of exhilarated joy at being champions, at winning? Together with the Holy Spirit, it's impossible to lose. 
These champions know whose power is at work. They see themselves through the eyes of God. Proverbs 23 verse 7, Proverbs 23 verse 7 says, As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. They see themselves through the eyes of God. Think of themselves the way that God does. That's why David could face Goliath. He didn't see himself as a little man. He saw the bigness of God inside of him. These champions, like us today, have and maintain a living relationship with the Holy Spirit. Let me declare one more time as I close. Champions for Christ, is that our choice? Is that who we are? Thank you for saying yes, ma'am. We are in it to win it. We win it because it has already been won by Jesus Christ, our victory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're in it to win it.